Sadade Kaya Sandu 
Sanje Zerda, Sanje Chonola. Sanje and secondly, because of the pandemic, people are not able to gather in big uh, groups. And so we are doing this teaching uh, on the Manam festival, the prayer festival, through the uh, webcast. So during the Mennam prayers, uh, sessions, uh, sometimes uh, it's very complicated. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, when I led the Manam prayers, I had first to um, prepare myself and train myself in order to be able to lead the afternoon sessions of prayer, which is called Gamsok. Um, so when uh, before I had to recite my prayer of the Sukhavati, uh, the chant masters had um, the first to uh, do their prayers and rituals, and uh, I feel very nervous. I had felt very nervous. And when I come to reciting uh, the. <coughs> lines which says when uh, we die and so forth, I would finally see some pigeons flying here and there. Otherwise, I was too nervous uh, that I couldn't see or be aware of what's going on. And I don't remember which uh, garden tiba it was. One time a uh, garden tiba was uh, all of a sudden uh, called by the 13th Dalai Lama, and he was actually leading the afternoon session of the prayer, <clears throat> and he had to get up, uh, get down from his throne, and had to go to... <laughs> and uh, the, the next person who uh, took over from him was so uh, afraid that it was uh, told by people that he had to, uh, he actually wet uh, the, uh, made the, the throne wet. Yeah. <clears throat> So because of the pandemic, we are not able to have big gatherings, but that doesn't really matter. So perhaps this uh, teaching is actually uh, going everywhere, uh, inside and outside Tibet. So when we webcast this teaching, perhaps uh, this uh, People inside Tibet are able to have access to this, and there are other people, uh, the Chinese in the uh, mainland China as well, who have faith. So I'm very glad to have this opportunity to give the teaching. Uh, 
So as usual, as it's the tradition, uh, we'll first uh, give uh, the teaching on the, uh, the uh, uh, the Jataka tales, and then as part of this teaching, I thought of also giving teaching on the uh, uh, the a precious garland by Master Nagarjun. Since the people even inside Tibet are able to have access to this teaching, we are today in the 21st century, and as Tibetans, many of us are in exile as refugees. On the one hand, regarding the, with regard to the teaching of the Buddha, which was taught according to the predisposition, mental dispositions of the disciples, and particularly for those who are of sharp in mind, the teaching is uh, supposed to be preserved through using logic by those with sharp minds. So on the one hand, we may have become exiles, but it has been a blessing in disguise because the, teach, the tradition, Tibetan tradition, uh, has spread to other parts of the world and uh, people of other religions as well as scientists are able to pay, take an interest in this tradition that we have and therefore so I wish to ta uh, go through the uh, historical accounts of Tibet in the 7th century in the past during Songzen Gampo's time, so Songzen Gampo, of course, we may call him an emanation of Avalokiteshwara. So he was someone who is vision, who was visionary and uh, could think uh, and had fast sight sightedness so he married the chinese princess and uh, the uh, jo shakyamuni statue in chokang was also brought from china into tibet at that time but though Song Sen Gampo already had very close ties with the Chinese uh, emperor at that time, he thought of de uh, devising a new uh, Tibetan script. So though the, he married the Chinese princess and must have actually enjoyed the Chinese food and uh, the princess and so forth, but when it comes to the writing, uh, system, he may have found the Chinese character to be too compl complex, and therefore he thought of devising a new Tibetan script, and modeled on the Indian uh, script, yeah, the Tibetan script was newly designed. And at his during his time, so because we have is our own written script, therefore in the eighth century when Shantarakshita, Abhat Shantarakshita the Great, was invited by Chis, the Tibetan Emperor Chisung Detsen, of course by that time. The Tibet and China had Tibet had very good relationship with China, China as well, but he found it would be better to take the Buddhism from India, its original um, place of origin, 
And therefore, Master Abbas Chandra Rakshita, the great, was um, invited to Tibet. And Chandra Rakshita had said that you have, uh, Tibetans, you have your own writing uh, system. And therefore, without having to resort to Sanskrit or Pali, uh, in the future, it would be good to translate the teachings into your own uh, language. So in the 8th century, that was uh, what Master Shandarakshita had said, and some of my friends have even told me that the Shand Master uh, Great Abbot Shandarakshita himself took interest in learning Tibetan. He also took interest in Tibetan. So, in this language, Tibetan, that we have, the unique, we have translations in this language of the Sanskrit and Pali texts. And we have over 300 volumes, 100 volumes of Kanjur, the translated words of the Buddha, and the uh, plus uh, 200 plus uh, volumes of the translated exegetical treatises. And so, since Songsen Kampo's time, when the Tibetan letter was um, re uh, de devised, and then during Tsung uh, Dezen's time, many of these uh, Indian literature were uh, translated into Tibetan. And then many Tibetan translators also visited, came to India and studied with uh, the Indian classical texts. And because uh, Shandarakshita came from Nalanda, Tibetan students also used Nalanda as their source of knowledge. And so the Nalanda tradition becomes the main tradition that the Tibetans are following. And so today, amongst the followers of the Nalanda, uh, uh, followers of the Sanskrit tradition of Buddhism, Tibetans are the only ones who uh, study extensively uh, the, uh, the uh, Buddhist uh, philosophy and literature. In China, this didn't used to be the case. And then particularly with regards to texts on logic and epistemology, though it seems there are some texts translated into Chinese, but they have not really um, uh, established the tradition of studying them. So, of course, uh, the uh, Vinaya texts may have been translated from the Pali tradition, but uh, then other texts, other uh, subjects like uh, sutras and tantras were translated from Sanskrit. So no other country or place has the same kind of length, a breadth of teaching translated into their language like Tibetan, uh, since we have the complete the teaching of the Buddha, including the Tantra, as well as the basic vehicle as well and the great vehicle traditions. So in the past, there was some kind of a discrimination or uh, people considered rather uncomfortable when they referred to Mahayana, like uh, Tibetans following Mahayana and but since we have interaction today with the other tradition, the Theravadas, so of course they don't use logic and reason. So the Nalanda Sanskrit tradition, which has spread to Tibet, uses logic and reason to explain and, uh, the, the, and uh, to establish the veracity of the teaching of the Buddha. 
So I uh, jokingly tell the Theravada friends that you uh, you are like uh, without the uh, any teeth because you when you come across very difficult points of the dharma you cannot chew it but because Tibetans we the Tibetans because we learn and study logic and epistemology we can chew on these uh, difficult subjects so we are like uh, having teeth so since the time of Songtsen Gampo the, and the other Tibetan emperors as well as uh, the uh, great translators and Indian Panditas, thanks to them we have uh, the Buddhist tradition which is unique, which is not there in other to, uh, Buddhist uh, followers of the Buddhist tradition. We have the complete teaching of the Buddha. So though we have become politically refugees and, or living in exile, it has been a blessing in disguise. And Tibetans inside Tibet, their uh, devotion and faith is unflinching. So because we have a very profound tradition of Buddhism, however much political persecution people may have gone through, people's minds, uh, it's, it, it's been very difficult to change their mind. So in the past, Tibetans uh, didn't have much interaction or connection with the outside world, but since we became exiles, we have had uh, very strong ties and connections with uh, people of the uh, other parts of the world, and therefore people are taking interest in our tradition, and we are using uh, logic and re reason. And since we have a very profound tradition of studying Buddhist philosophy, epistemology, and so forth, and therefore the Tibetans inside Tibet should find this our pride, should be proud of this. So the hardliner Chinese authorities may be very narrow-minded, but if they are really well educated, they would really find what Tibetan Buddhism stands for. And uh, uh, though people may be uh, <laughs> So Mao Zedong, when I was able to see Mao Zedong, I had felt very, uh, felt him admirable and communism to be very, uh, and socialism to be very admirable because the, the principle is to look after the general public, but it has declined, so it's no more there. So I had a friend, Shimon Peretz, I think, Israeli Shimon Peretz, was my friend. He also won the Nobel Peace Prize. So usually uh, he was very fond of socialism as well. So he was also fond of China too. And uh, during a Nobel Peace Prize winners' uh, con meeting, others were uh, other uh, laureates were actually criticizing China, and he was feeling uncomfortable. And after some years, when I met him, I told him, "You admire socialism in, in China, and what is the situation of China now?" And he told me that China is no more socialist country; it is the worst kind of capitalism. So during Mao Zedong's times, the P, uh, were known as the uh, Red Guards. <clears throat> 
were really devoted to the well-being, welfare of the people, the public, and I was quite excited at that time when I was in China and even told the Mao Zedong or the Chinese that I wanted to join the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party. <coughs> Shimon Peretz. So Shimon Peretz, as he said, so there is huge difference between the rich and the poor, and the situation is very complicated today in China. So the Tibetans, the majority of Tibetans inside Tibet, Though you may not have much knowledge of it, you have been able to keep uh, this tradition through your faith and devotion. So Tibetans I see in, uh, uh, through media that uh, even I mean, young and old, all, everyone does prostration in front at the Chokang. And so this shows your strong devotion. And so this, the, the Buddhist tradition is like the soul of the Tibetan tradition, of the Tibetan people. So this tradition of Buddhism that we have, which is based on logic and reason, may also spread in China proper, and also Mongolia, and other parts. So, so I would like to ask the Tibetans inside Tibet, the majority of Tibetans, to be at ease. So I wish to send this message to them. So they, because of their devotion being so firm, so that's what I wish to say. And with regard to the Jataka tales, and then with regard to Tibetans inside Tibet, the uh, I wish to ask the younger generation to pay more attention to Tibetan because the Ganyur and Dengur, the translations of the words of the Buddha and the uh, explanatory tenses are in our own language. So because these are in our own language, <coughs> Tibetan, I wish to urge them to pay more attention to our to Tibetan. So, of course, in politics and other subjects, Chinese may be more um, used more. But with regard to Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist uh, logic, and so forth, they are in our language, Tibetan. So I wish to urge Tibetans inside Tibet this, uh, that they pay attention, more attention to Tibetan. And when we came into exile, I requested, I appealed to Pandit Nehru to have uh, separate schools set up for Tibetan children because we have our own language. <clears throat> so Tibetans inside Tibet in general, and particularly those of the younger generation, I wish to urge you to pay more attention to Tibetan. <coughs> <coughs> so the hardliner Chinese authority officials are trying to um, wipe out Tibetan language.
And so I wish to urge the younger generation particularly to pay more attention to Tibetan language itself. So I see uh, in the, on the internet that in Xiling, in, in schools, there are uh, this, uh, people of Xiling area to, uh, in schools, they teach Tibetan, which didn't used to exist in the past. So Tibetans in all regions of Tibet, the three provinces, to you, I wish to uh, urge you to pay more attention to Tibetan language because we have the same language. Siling people in Siling have their own accent maybe dialect, compass have their own dialect, which may be difficult for others to understand. Or, so I wish to make this appeal or urge the Tibetans. This is not being, at, uh, say, being at, uh, attached to our language, but in this language, we are able to explain the entire teaching of the Buddha. Which comes to us from the Nalanda tradition. And therefore, the Tibetans, as Tibetans, we should be proud of being Tibetans and also pay attention to our language. As I said before, regarding logic and epistemology, the texts like um, Pramana Vartika Karika by Damakirti and uh, so forth. Uh, we should pay attention to studying them. And then people in the Himalayan regions also should study the, these texts. So I wish to urge the Tibetans inside Tibet to pay more attention to our own language, Tibetan. So studying religion doesn't mean that you have to be religious as such, because there are scientists who are my friends. They do study Buddhism, and they have, of course, they are not learning from Buddhism uh, because of their having faith in Buddh uh, Buddhism as such. Because Buddhism is not only about faith, but it, we use logic. And therefore, we can study Buddhism through logic and epistemology in order to understand the teaching. So, studying Oh. So I think it's on his reading from the So it says that uh, of course, with regard to um, faith, it exists in all religious traditions, whether it's Islam or Christianity or Judaism. But when it comes to using logic, the even the Buddha himself has said, oh, monks and scholars, just as gold is tested by burning rabbin cutting, likewise you should examine my teaching thoroughly and then accept it, not because you have faith or devotion in me. And so he asked us to study and experiment his teaching, not follow it through uh, uh, on the based on faith alone. And so Tibetans inside Tibet and particularly the younger generation. So it seems you have good, uh, you do pay attention to learning it, but I wish to uh, reiterate this point. Okay, 
So as it is the tradition on this full moon day of the special day of the day of the, the month of miracles when the Buddha had discussions with the non-Buddhist teachers and also uh, uh, contest in miracles. So as it is the tradition to read the, uh, the Jataka Mala, so I wish to read from where we left the previous time. So we are in chapter 9, Vishwantara. So the, we are, um, he's on his reading at a point where it says the ministers who were complaining to the king that uh, the prince Vishantara was not worthy of being uh, the ruler because of giving away his elephants which belonged to the kingdom and so forth. So the king, because of having to abandon the um, expelled his prince, was feeling very dejected and despondent and and then he told the uh, subjects. So, so the king asked he was very sad and his face was wet with tears and he cried in sorrow and then the Bodhisattva the, the uh, Vishwantara came, went to his father so here we are. The Vishwantara was asking why the people of Shimbi, Shibi were not uh, I mean, were disliking me and so forth. There is chapter 9, and he's always wanted to stop there. So with regard to Master Shah uh, Nagarjun, and now we are going to the next text. So for the um, 
The Theravada, followers of the Theravada tradition, Master Nagarjuna may not be a significant person, but for the Nalanda tradition, he was a significant person. Or he is <clears throat> so with regard to the teaching of the Buddha, uh, the second turning, during the second turning of the Dharma, <clears throat> The Buddha taught how uh, to, to how to, to uh, cessation is achieved, and so he taught the professional wisdom sutras. So I don't usually prefer to use Mahayana and Hinayana. But it's, I find it better to use the terms Sanskrit tradition and Pali traditions of Buddhism. So they are more appropriate. So with regard to the, Nalanda, uh, the, the Sanskrit tradition, in this, Master Nagarjuna was uh, an, an incredible personality so it's not that we consider him great because he was prophesied by the Buddha but if you look at his own writings read and study them you will find how great he must have been so having written the six texts on large reasoning we have the Mula Madhyamaka Karika uh, refutation of the ob or objection of uh, arguments and 60 stanzas of uh, reason and 70 stanzas of em on emptiness and so forth. And then uh, with regard to the, uh, the uh, extensive path aspect, he wrote this um, Ratnavali, the precious garland. So I thought of teaching this today. I received teaching on this from Sekong Rinpoche. I don't remember where, uh, who he received it from. So the title in Sanskrit is Raja Parikata Ratna Vamali. In Tibetan, Gyevola Tamchawa Rinpoche. And then there is the uh, homage to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And here the expression of worship, the first verse is, I bow down to the omniscient, freed from all defects, adorned with all good qualities, the sole friend of all beings. This covers a vast subject. So it defines the Buddha being free from all defects, all faults, even their um, seeds, and not only through large uh, faith, but by using critical uh, scrutiny, uh, scrutinizing wisdom, understanding that all faults, all our shortcomings are rooted in ignorance, and therefore, by understanding the true reality of how things exist, you um, get uh, overcome or uh, eliminate or uproot this through wisdom, understanding reality. And so the Buddha had become someone who has reached the pinnacle of abandonment, and because of his wisdom, understanding the truth as it is, he has also overcome all the defilements in mind stream and therefore is able to see everything uh, clearly uh, in, in, in one instance. And because of his compassion, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore he is uh, learned or, or knowledgeable, and he is compassionate to all sentient beings, and not uh, uh, has not fallen into the extreme of uh, liberation or nirvana, uh, the peace uh, of nirvana. 
And so as the uh, salutation verse of uh, uh, Brahmana Samuchaya says, the Buddha is the uh, teacher, protector, and so forth. And so the Buddha first generated bodhicitta and then went uh, through the uh, accumulation of merit and wisdom over three countless eons. So the main reason for doing that is to benefit sentient beings. That was his sole goal. So the sentient beings who are is as vast in number as the expanse of the space. And so, therefore, uh, he was adorned with all good qualities, the sole friend of all beings. And so, oh, and then the next verse, O King, I'll explain, practice solely virtues to generate in, your, in you the doctrine, for the practices will be established in a vessel of the excellent doctrine. So the king here is um, Gautami Putra, so Master Shantanagarjuna is referring to him <laughs> as the vessel for the excellent teaching. So what, what does this dharma or the doctrine comprise? In one who first practices high status, definite goodness arises later. For having attained high status, one comes gradually to infinite goodness. And so in order to be able to pursue the study of this profound and vast teaching, we need to have a, a, a higher rebirth. And therefore, it says, higher status first. And so having attained this high status, then the, uh, one, one goes through the study, reflection, and meditation on the teaching, and thereby attain the definite goodness. High status is considered to be happiness. Definite goodness is liberation. The quintessence of these means is, uh, their means is briefly faith and wisdom. So for the higher rebirth, Faith is very important. So when it's not just a blind belief or faith, but when we think about highest faith, we also think of the, how karma works and how to avoid non-virtuous actions and cultivate the virtuous ones. And so those things which are slightly hidden, should, we should be able to uh, draw or uh, gain conviction through empirical reasoning or reason based on evidence. Due to having faith, one relies on the practices. Verse number five. So faith is considered important in all religions, and in order to have, uh, uh, in order to strengthen our faith, there are different philosophical uh, concepts that are used in the different traditions. But in Buddhism, because we use logic, it becomes quite uncomfortable, inconvenient to um, assert a creator God. So of these two, wisdom is the chief, faith is its prerequisite. So one who does not, the, the next verse, number six, so it's, it mentions six factors through desire, hatred, fear, or bewilderment, is known as one of faith, a superior vessel for definite goodness. So having analyzed, number seven, having analyzed well all deeds of body, speech, and mind, those who realized what benefits self and others and always perform those 
These are wise. And so first you restrain yourself from committing non-virtuous actions and then you uh, act on the no virtuous practices. And so not killing, not stealing, forsaking the mate of others, refraining completely from false, divisive, harsh and senseless speech, and thoroughly forsaking covetous. So through thoroughly forsaking covetousness, harmful intent, and the views of nihilists, these are the ten gleaming paths of actions. The, the opposite are dark. So as we say, may I overcome the, the three actions of the non-virtuous actions of the body, four of speech and three of mind, and then on top of these ten, abandoning drinking um, alcohol, a good livelihood, uh, where you don't uh, try to use false means of gaining uh, wealth and so forth, and non-harming, and then when you give alms to some poor people give it with giving it with respect understanding that this actually is a means of accumulating merit for me and therefore you give with respect so respectful giving and then honoring the honorable such as the three jewels and then cultivating love towards all sentient beings and practice in brief is that. So practice is not done by just mortifying the body for one has not forsaken injuring others and is not helping others. So in this case, in, there is this mention of the not drinking alcohol when we take the upasaka, the lay person's precepts, this is one of the precepts that uh, the lay persons uh, take. And at one time, my senior, late senior tutor, so when he was uh, living in Dharamsala, one time an elderly Tibetan went to him to uh, receive the five Upasaka vows. And at that point, when the young Ling uh, explained the five precepts and not, um, when he mentioned not drinking alcohol, this elderly man said, oh, I cannot give up drinking alcohol. And so young Ling Rinpoche very kindly told him, in that case, in that case uh, he shouldn't uh, drink much, but a little bit. Because if Yongzini Rinpoche had said that, oh, that's not going to work, then you cannot receive, that may not have been good. And so, following this example, I also tell people that when people receive these uh, Upasaka vows, I also tell them that not to re drink too much to the point of drinking, you know, bring, uh, becoming inebriated. And so, as Linobuche had uh, practiced, I also teach, tell people not to drink too much excessively. <laughs> Because there are some people who, uh, though maybe quite um, uh, rude and generally, but after drinking alcohol, they become rather more sober. So mortifying the body, verse number 11 mentions that, such as... Uh, you know, fasting excessively. So for one, 
has not forsaken enduring others and is not helping others. And so even if you may practice fasting, if it has nothing to do with helping others, benefiting others, then it's not uh, beneficial to others. Those not esteeming the great path of excellent doctrine bring with giving ethics and patience, afflict their bodies, taking an aberrant path like a cow path, deceiving oneself and those following, their bodies embraced by the vicious snakes. So abstaining or giving up the ten non-virtuous actions has actually to do with benefiting, helping yourself because a short life comes through killing, much suffering comes through harming others. So if you harm, if you, if you harm others, they, you will cause others to be angry with you, dislike you, and then poor resources through stealing. So because of Stealing, you will be a destitute. Enemies through adultery or sexual misconduct because you cause anger in the, um, the, the, the near and dear ones of the other person in relation to whom you have committed this. From lying arises slander. Even to the animals, if you lie to them, if you tell lies, they would also sh uh, sh shirk you. So from divisiveness, a parting of friends. So you talk one thing to one person, another thing to another person, and then in the end, you are left alone. You will have no friends. From harshness, hearing the unpleasant. From senselessness, one's speech is not respected. Covetousness destroys one's wishes. Number 16. Wrongful intent yields fright. Wrong views lead to bad views. And drink to confusion of the mind. Number um, 17 read. 18, a bad complexion comes through anger, stupidity from not questioning the wise. So if you practice not drinking alcohol, being loving to others and uh, giving respectfully and not harming others, of course you, these add to uh, the, uh, the factors for attaining higher rebirth, and in that uh, higher rebirth, you will also be able to engage in study to increase your understanding, your wisdom as well. And these are the effects for humans, but prior to all is a bad transmigration, Opposite to the well-known fruits of these the, uh, non-virtues is the arising of effects caused by all virtues. And then verse number 20, 21, 22, desisting from all non-virtues, non-virtues and always engaging in virtues with body, speech and mind. These are called the three forms of practice. 23, 24, 25, the, definites, the doctrines of definite goodness are set by the conquerors to be conquerors, to be deep, subtle, and frightening to the childish who are not learned. And so up to this is the teaching on the higher rebirth. So I'll stop here. The next verses deal with the definite goodness. And then next I wish to do, so we leave at verse number 20, finish with verse number 25. And so here we have Ladakhi devotees who have requested this um, Bodhicitta's uh, ceremony. 
And so because this is the month commemorating the Buddha, the main thing to do here when commemorating the Buddha is to have a good heart, a warm heart. So you have to see the, 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 uh, the, the pros and cons of having a good heart to oneself and what is bad about not uh, being uh, having a bad um, intention. So even if you wish to achieve your own goal, you need to cultivate bodhicitta. If you do that, from life after life, you will have a good rebirth and also you will have good um, uh, understanding and wisdom. And so bodhicitta helps to fulfill one's own goal life after life. And if you practice altruism, the intention to help others, you will have be befriend be friends with others, uh, all others, and others also re respect you, and you will have you will have more and more people friendly, uh, who are friendly with you, near and dear ones to you, as well. So since we are dependent on the community we live in, and therefore, you if you show respect and love towards others. You will have more friends. And scientists say that as human beings, we are social beings. So even animals who live in communities, they will not try to separate themselves from their community. And so since we are dependent on our community, we should be sincere, respectful, and <coughs> have the intention to be um, kind to others, and therefore the, the, we will have a good. We will be able to have live in a good community. And so, even if you wish to be happy, I mean, to to achieve your own goal, you need to be. So with Bodhicitta, you will have more friends and life after life, you will have, uh, and you'll be able to benefit yourself as it says in this text, when we take bodhisattva vows, in order to fulfill the aims of myself and others, I shall develop the spirit of enlightenment. And having developed this spirit of highest enlightenment, I shall invite all sentient beings as my guests. So having developed this bodhicitta, you are calling on others, all sentient beings, as your guests for happiness as Shantideva says in Bodhisattva Ayatava, all happiness and joy in the world comes from wishing others to be happy all suffering comes from wishing oneself own to be happy and what need is there to say more look at the difference between the selfish the childish sentient beings and those of the Buddhas and then, as I usually uh, recite this on a daily basis, unless you exchange your joy and happiness with the suffering of others, leave alone attaining brotherhood, even in samsara, in this cycle of existence, you will not have happiness. So, without having to talk about next lives, even in this life alone, you can see if you don't care about others, and uh, you will not be happy. So, having developed the spirit of highest enlightenment, I shall invite all sentient beings, I guess. And as Bodhisattva Charyavatara says, also, 
So when I think on this line from Bodhisattva Charyavatara, uh, where it ends by saying uh, um, gods and demigods and so forth, be joyous. So when we come across certain lines in the uh, prayers to the Dharma, uh, protectors, we sometimes ask them to take care of those on our, our side and get rid of those who are our uh, opponents. So I sometimes find it laughable. So even scientifically speaking, we need to be altruistic towards all sentient beings. So for the Bodhisattva the Bodhicitta ceremony, imagine the Buddha in front of us in this space, replete with all the major and minor marks. So though the Buddha as a, as a, a Nirmanakaya form of body is not accessible to us and we are not able to receive teachings from such a Buddha in the emanation, the supreme emanation body. So for the last over 2,500 2,500 years since the Buddha passed away, we have our own gurus, our spiritual masters, whom we rely on, depend on, for understanding the teaching of the Buddha and being able to do the practices and so forth. And so, and also that we have the opportunity to serve them and they are our examples since the Buddha's time down to our lineage masters. So these lineage and the root teachers are the ones who are carrying uh, forth the uh, enlightened deeds of the Buddha. So imagine the Buddha and uh, all the uh, lineage masters down to your own root guru in front of you. And so in front of them, let us take the bodhisattva, uh, uh, generate bodhicitta. So so the, the reason why we are able to have um, keep our faith in the teaching of the Buddha, though we are not able to see the Buddha himself in person, but because of our lineage and root teachers, we have access to the teaching of the Buddha. And so... Yeah, let's say the seven limb prayer. Making offerings, beautiful flowers and regal garlands and so forth. I offer you to you, victorious ones, fine dress, fragrant perfumes, sandalwood powder heaped, high as Mount Meru, 
all wondrous offerings in spectacular array I offer to you, victorious ones, with transcendent offerings, peerless and vast, and so forth. I offer it and bow down to all victorious ones. With transcendent offerings, peerless and vast, and so I open, I bow down and to all victorious Every harmful action I have done with my body, speech, and mind, overwhelmed by attachment, anger, and confusion, all these I openly lay bare to you before you. I lift up my heart and rejoice in all positive potential of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in all ten directions of solitary realizing here is still training and those beyond and of all ordinary beings. And then whatever slight positive potential I may have created by paying homage, offering, acknowledging my faults, rejoicing and requesting that the Buddhas stay and teach, I now dedicate all this for full awakening. So for this bodhicitta, we are going to use the text which... So if it's comfortable, please sit. Uh, crouch or kneel on your right knee. If you have bad knees or legs, it's an exception. So... In front of you in the space, imagine Buddha and the Bodhisattvas surrounding him together with those of our lineage lamas and our root guru. Have them, in, imagine them clearly in your mind and think that just as they have generated Bodhicitta, and have benefited other sentient beings, I will also have the same aspiration to help all sentient beings by generating bodhicitta and tread along the path uh, the, uh, to enlightenment, path comprising uh, part of accumulation, parts of accumulation, preparation or application, uh, seeing, meditation, and then the normal learning. And so, have this firm determination, have a strong intention and have this firm determination to work for the benefit of others. When I have this opportunity, when I have, where I have re attained this human body, this precious human life, and having the access to the teaching of the Buddha to study, reflect, and meditate. So at such time, have this determination to become someone beneficial to all. As the... So as uh, Master Shand, uh, Chandra Kirti says at the, towards the end of the uh, sixth chapter, where he says, um, thus illuminated by the rays of wisdom of light down to the end of that chapter, to, uh, to verses 24, 224, 20, 225, and 26, let us have this strong determination to become enlightened for the benefit of the Please repeat these lines. <laughs> I seek refuge in the three jewels. I confess all mysteries individually. I rejoice in the virtuous deeds of all beings. I take to mind Buddha's enlightenment. To the Buddha, Dharma, and the highest assembly, I seek refuge until I am enlightened to fulfill the interests of myself and as I shall generate the mind of awakening. Having generated the mind for highest awakening, I shall invite all sentient beings to my guests. I shall engage in the life of supreme practices of enlightenment. May I achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. And so uh, strengthen your compassion towards sentient beings wishing to liberate all sentient beings from suffering and also have a strong faith in the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and our lineage lamas and so forth. So just as you have generated Bodhicitta and engage in the Bodhisattva deeds for the benefit of all sentient beings, I shall also follow suit 
to uh, uh, generate bodhicitta within myself and to train in the bodhisattva practices for the benefit of all sentient beings so that I will be able to benefit others without any effort, effortlessly. I seek refuge. Please repeat. I seek refuge in the three jewels. I confess all mysteries individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all deeds, of all beings. I take to mind the Buddha's enlightenment, the Buddha Dhamma in highest assembly. I seek refuge until I reach enlightenment to fulfill the interests of myself and I shall generate the mind for awakening. Having generated the mind for highest awakening, I shall invite all sentient beings and my guests. I shall engage in the delightful supreme practices of enlightenment. May I achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of sentient beings. So having done this repeated the second two times, at the end of the third repetition, when you finish saying, when you say, I, may I achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. So not, you are not seeking benefit for yourself, but benefit of sentient beings. So have this strong pledge, make that strong pledge. To benefit I, should, I seek refuge in the three jewels. I confess all means. This individual, I rejoice in the virtuous deeds of all beings. I take to heart Buddha's enlightenment. To the Buddha Dharma and his assembly, highest assembly, I seek refuge in the until I enlightenment. To fulfill the interests of myself and others, I should generate the mind for awakening. Having generated the mind for highest awakening, I shall invite all sentient beings to my guests. I shall engage in the delightful supreme practices of enlightenment. To May I benefit Vyakama Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So with this, you have taken the Bodhisattva vows. We are done with this. So as the Ladakh, people from Ladakh have in, uh, requested, I have done this Bodhisattva ceremony. So Bodhicitta is the essence of Dharma. So whenever uh, on all occasions I think of bodhicitta, of course, in order to all be able to to be able to get rid of all defilements, you need the understanding of emptiness, which cuts the root of this clinging to true ignorance, uh, clinging to true existence and things and beings. And that helps to generate bodhicitta as well. So I do uh, many different deity yoga practices, such as the uh, Guya Samaja, Yamantaka, Vajrabharava, Heruka, Chakrasamvara, and uh, uh, hey Vajra Tantra and so forth. But my main practice is Bodhicitta. Perhaps Domtempa has said, Domtempa may have come up with these terms, the extensive conduct lineage and the profound lineage of the view. So it's the, the extensive Conduct lineage emphasizes on uh, uh, talks about the bodhicitta. So, and then the profound lineage view has to do with emptiness, view of emptiness, understanding that. So there is no greater since there is no greater practice than bodhicitta and the view of emptiness. I don't find uh, it apt to use the term uh, the blessing lineage of the practice. So the Buddha gave teachings of the profound and the extensive conduct. So these are what we need to do. Whether you're doing the sutra practice or tantra practice, they are indispensable. So with this, we are done with today's discourse. So for you all, I wish to say that dharma has nothing to do with external expressions of using musical instruments and wearing different costumes and so forth. But 
to do with bodhicitta and understanding of emptiness. So, so then we are doing, going to do the concluding practice of saying the prayers, the prayer for the flourishing of the Dharma. <laughs> So this is called Den Varma in Tibetan, prayer for the flourishing of the doctrine. So through the hardships I've endured, formerly for being's sake, and through my renouncing pleasure, may the doctrine flourish long. Since I have given my livelihood for the sake of sick people, so protecting needy pe- beings, may the doctrine flourish long. Through my giving son and daughter, wife, wealth, jewels, elephant, and my chariot for awakening, may the doctrine flourish long. Through my giving honor to Buddhas and prayer, but the Pratyaka Buddha's hearers, parents, and ascetics made the doctrine flourish. Through my ta- tasting diverse sufferings for many million eons and seeking learning for awakening, made the doctrine flourish. Through my saving beings from wrong views to establish them in right view, once I have method and wisdom made the dharma prosper through my feeling beings, freeing beings from pleasures, fire, with the four attractions, and subduing growing evil. May my followers stay long through my saving Tirthikas from the flood of other views, fixing them in right view. May my followers be faithful always. May the doctrine flourish. That the Dharma King Tsongkhapa's Dharma method may prosper. Let all adverse signs be stilled and good conditions be complete. Thanks to mine and others joined two collections of the three times. May the doctrine of the conqueror, Laws on Dagba, flourish long. And then the final auspicious verses relating to the three jewels with that. So through the auspiciousness of the lamas and then the idams, med- meditation deities, and the blessings through the auspiciousness of the buddhas of the ten directions, and then through the blessings, auspiciousness of the darkest and darkenies, and then the, through the auspiciousness of the Dharma protectors. May there be auspiciousness for all beings. Yeah, 
This is the final lumbering prayer. collections, vast in space that I have amassed from working with effort. At this practice for a great length of time, may I become chief, leading with of all those whose minds uh, wisdom is blinded by ignorance. Even if I do not reach this state, may I be held in your loving compassion for all life's manjushri. May I find the best of complete, graduate, graded paths of the teachings, and may I please all the Buddhas by my practice, using skillful means drawn from, drawn by a strong force of compassion, may I clear the darkness from the minds of all beings with the points of path as I have discerned them. May I uphold the Buddha's teaching for a very long time with my heart going out with great compassion in whatever direction the most precious teachings have not yet spread. <clears throat> have not yet spread, or once spread, have declined. May I reveal this treasure of happiness and aid. May the minds of those who wish for liberation be granted bounteous peace, and the Buddha's deeds be nourished for a long time by, e by even this graded path of enlightenment completed due to the wondrous virtuous conduct of the Buddha's in this tune. May all humans and non-humans who eliminate adversity and create conducive conditions for practice of the excellent path never be parted in all in any of their lives from the purest path praised by the Buddhas. Whenever someone makes effort to act in accordance with the tenfold, tenfold Mayan of virtuous practices, may they always be assisted by the mighty ones, and may oceans of prosperity spread everywhere.
Master Tonkapa. Oh, oh, oh. 